All right, guys, how's it going? So we've just entered the final quarter of 2017. And generally speaking, at this time of the year, the number of tech releases really slow down. That's certainly been the case in the previous years. You generally find that all these companies are now gearing up for CES at the beginning of next year. We saw that with Intel last year and KB Lake. AMD were a little bit slower in launching Ryzen, but that was a brand new architecture. So for this next three months, the tech news will definitely be drying up a little. Now with that said, there is obviously a very, very big release coming soon. I'm going to talk about that later after I start with probably one of the biggest pieces of news of the past week and that was the Forza 7 benchmark where Vega had more gasoline in the blood than Pascal. Now we'll start off by forgiving Google Translate for this poor translation. It is an AI after all and its German is way better than mine. But what happened here was an extremely curious result in Microsoft Studios new driving game Forza 7 and predictably I got a few requests to take a closer look at this. I actually contacted Microsoft Microsoft for a copy of the game but they didn't respond. Now it's safe to say it's a really really good looking game and very well optimised. But the first benchmark we see has some rather curious performance as noted. At 4K resolution we can see that Vega 64 here has a pretty big lead over the GTX 1080 Founders Edition. Now the lead definitely diminishes with more anti-aliasing, but even at the ATX multi-sample anti-aliasing has still around a 10% lead there. Now Computer Base tested three resolutions, the big three of course, 1080p, 1440p and 4K. Maximum graphics, 100% resolution scaling and as mentioned the ATX MSAA. And starting off with 10 1080p and that is a really really curious result as not only is Vega 64 leading by a distance, Vega 56 is also 10% ahead of the GTX 1080 Ti. Taking a look down the list, we've got Fury X a little bit behind the 1070, it's closer than it would normally be in the average game and we've also got the RX 580 just maybe a little bit further ahead of the GTX 1060 than it normally would be too. But it's right at the very top where the curiosity is for sure, with both Vegas clearly ahead of the 1080 Ti. Looking at the 99th percentile frame times, it's all pretty similar from the 1080 Ti upwards. So Vega 64 is 23% ahead of the 1080 Ti at 1080p. Moving on to 1440p, we can instantly see that the 1080 Ti has now just taken over Vega 56, but still quite a bit behind 64. There's a bit of a gap opening now between the 1070 and Fury X though, and the 580 and 1060 are almost identical, so this is starting to look more like what we would expect to see, with the exception of course at the very top. So finally moving on to 4K, and now some kind of normality has resumed with the GTX 1080 Ti at the top, but that's a less than 10% victory, and Vega 64 is still quite clearly ahead of the GTX 1080. Interesting to note that the GTX 1060 is now ahead of the RX 580, by over 10% in fact, Fury Hicks has died a horrible death here and that is clearly down to the 4 gigabytes of VRAM running out at 4K. Now obviously these 1080p results were a very big talking point. In the past at 1080p we've seen with AMD cards that they had that old driver overhead, DX11 driver overhead, this is actually DirectX 12. So you would expect AMD cards to do better. But what we're seeing here appears to be some kind of driver overhead on the Nvidia cards. We can see this because if you just concentrate on the green bars, the 1080 Ti is only 7% ahead of the GTX 1080, which is a much smaller gap than you would expect. And the 1070 is only 15% ahead of the 1060, again a much smaller gap than we would expect to see. The gap between the 1080 Ti and 1080 is only 8% at 1440p, but the gap between the 1070 and 1060 is now up to 26%, which is still a little bit short of what we'd expect. And finally at 4K, the 1080 Ti is 20% now ahead of of the GTX 1080, so that is getting closer to where it should be. It should be around 30-35%, so we can see here that the 1080 Ti is still having some kind of bottleneck even at 4K, whereas the gap between the 1070 and the 1060 has increased to 32%. That's still not quite where it should be either though. So this just looks like a CPU limitation and for some reason Vega is doing an awful lot better. If you look at 1080p, the AMD cards are all doing a lot better than they should be, but Vega also appears to be doing that extra bit better compared to what it had been doing against other AMD cards, with the Vega 64 being 60% ahead of the Fury X. That's way ahead of the average of what we saw in the Vega 64 reviews, which were nearer to 25-30%, and even at 14 40p we're looking at a 64% lead. Sadly we can't look at the true gap at 4k because Fury X dies. Whatever is going on here, Vega appears to be doing very well with a CPU bottleneck. But what's really interesting here is this is not the only time we 
we've seen this last month in fact during the Vega 56 review over at TechSpot and Hardware Unboxed and we saw Vega 56 beating the 1080 Ti again, this time in Dirt 4 and again at 1080p. And once again we saw that the 1070 wasn't that far ahead of the 580 or the Fury X and the 580 was well ahead of the GTX 1060. Now this was Steve over at Hardware Unboxed that did this and a bit of a head scratcher for him until he figured out that it was down to the anti-aliasing, the CMAA, which stands for Conservative Morphological Anti-Aliasing was actually developed by Intel I believe but again a very odd looking benchmark even looking at the 1% minimums Vega completely destroys the rest of the cards that is a huge margin on the minimums once we get to 1440p and we're starting to see a repeat of what we saw in Forza 7 the 1080 Ti does now beat the Vega 56 but the 56 is still clear of the 1080 again we've got a shrinking gap between the 580 and the 1060 and when we finally move on to 4k once again some kind of normality has resumed so that's two driving games and two strange results. I'd be once again looking at a CPU limit here though as that is only a 16% gap between the GTX 1080 Ti and the GTX 1080. That does appear to be the case but once again Vega is less affected by it and as it turns out those weren't the only times that this behaviour was noted. Another game, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, this is a game where AMD was doing terribly and apart from in one benchmark. Now this is over at PC Games Hardware and instead of doing the usual running the game at ultra settings they decided to benchmark on the high preset and there is the rather curious result RX Vega 64 a little bit ahead of RX Vega 56 and both cards with a fair lead over the GTX 1080 Ti Strix overclocked. Now you know the drill by now, the 1080 Ti Gaming 1 is not that far behind the 1080 Ti and in this case even the 1070 and the 1060 are all very very close. We're looking at what is a clear CPU bottleneck. There's no way an overclocked 1080 Ti should only be 4 frames per second ahead of a GTX 1060. And we can even see here that the 1060 is above Fury X. But Fury X is not that far ahead of the RX 580 so even the AMD cards appear to be hitting some kind of CPU bottleneck all of them apart from Vega once again. So this is now three times we've seen clear evidence of a CPU bottleneck and on all three occasions we can see that Vega seems to deal with it an awful lot better than what the high-end Nvidia cards do. Moving on to 1440p, the GTX 1070 even beats Vega 64 and at 4K the results are terrible for the AMD cards. I mean what is all this about? I simply do not know. But what it looks like is Vega simply deals better with a CPU bottleneck. It makes no sense to me though and there's been no suggestion from AMD as to why this is happening. I had considered that maybe the high bandwidth cache is having an effect here and I've heard some other reasons like it could be down to instruction prefetching which may well be combining with the high bandwidth cache. It's just important possible to tell with the information we have. Some of these results though are mind boggling. Look at the difference in 1% minimums. That is huge. But to me, I think this is more of an Nvidia issue than something that AMD is doing well. But no doubt we'll find out more about this over the next few months. Would this actually make me change my opinion of Vega? In all honesty, no I don't think it would. I would not go out and spend more on Vega compared to its Nvidia competition. Certainly not based on one result, not even on two results and not even on the three results. Because if you look at any other 90 27 games out of 100, I'm pretty sure you're gonna find the opposite with the 1080 Ti a very, very long way ahead. So moving on to Coffee Lake. Now at the beginning of the video I mentioned how generally very few products are released in the final quarter of the year. And this is one of the big surprises about Intel's Coffee Lake release, which as you know launches on the 5th of October. So maybe even as you're watching this video, assuming I get it finished in time. But Coffee Lake released on 5th of October and last week we got to see some benchmark numbers at the Chinese site EXP Review or is it XP? preview, I don't know what it's called, but we got some initial benchmark numbers. Comparing the new 6 core 12 thread i7-8700K to the older i7-7700K which is of course 8 threads and also the i7-7800X which is again 12 threads but this one is of course on Intel's high-end desktop platform. Now instantly we can see it's all pretty similar in 3D Mark, everything you would expect to see with the same GTX 1080 Ti graphics card. There's just a little gap to the 7700K, it's around 750 points in 
fact, which is actually quite a gap. And in Time Spy, we can see another gap of around 100 points. But looking at the games, Ashes of the Singularity, the 8700K does pretty well. Of course, we already know that Ashes of the Singularity scales very well with extra threads. In most cases, that is. It doesn't really do that with the 7800X, but that's got its own issues. So we're starting off with a decent win, which is all about the extra cores. Looking at the Witcher 3, that's another pretty good result. But again, we know that Witcher 3 scales pretty well with extra cores. Looking at Rise of the Tomb Raider, this is the inbuilt benchmark. And it has a little loss there to the 7700K. Only 8 frames per second though, up at 170 frames. So not an awful lot. Again, another very small loss in the Division. Which is an interesting one, because the Division does scale well with cores. And finally, a decent one in Hitman. Which again, we know scales very well with extra cores. On average, it's a 1.43% lead over the 7700K. And what looks to me like a very favourable benchmark suite. Now, it's going to be close anyway, because if we just look at the specs, and simply concentrating on the 8700K, it's got a 3.7 GHz base clock and a 4.7 GHz boost clock. That's a single core turbo frequency. But we know that it does 4.6 GHz on two cores, down to something like 4.3 GHz on six cores. So 4.3 GHz, that is actually quite a lot. Performance-wise, in the vast majority of cases in gaming, will be very similar to the i7 7700K. Looking at the benchmarks again, the productivity performance, not an awesome victory of only 8.14%, but a lot of these productivity benchmarks are actually quite single threaded, and that's why. The 7700K generally does pretty well in those anyway, but this 8.14% lead has come from those benchmarks where the extra threads actually do matter. Probably the most interesting one was the synthetic performance. You get stuff like your W Prime and your WinRAR and 7 Zip, as well as Blender and Cinebench. I'm not convinced that this should be synthetic performance, as these are actual applications. The single thread of 1.67% ahead, that looks like it's all coming down to the 4.7 GHz single thread compared to the 4.5 GHz of the 7700K. But this is a pretty decent multi-thread lead of 42.49%. You can see the multi-thread Cinebench of 1262. That's a score that puts it a little bit ahead of the Ryzen 5 1600X. And that is only 31% ahead of the i7 7700K. That is actually quite a weak result though, as in stuff like Blender and in the X264 benchmark, it's over 40% ahead. You would expect with 50% more threads that on average we should be looking at between 40 and 50% extra performance. With perfect scaling, it should be 50% at the same clock speed. Looking here at the i7-7800X, which is well ahead of the 8700K, this is all down to the quad channel memory and the real synthetic stuff, for example in Sandra 2016. We've seen some much higher scores here for the 7 800X, but that's all down to the quad channel memory. But everywhere else, it's mostly well behind. A lot of which comes down to the clock speed. Now, just as an aside, quite a few reviewers come in for a bit of stick during the Skylake X reviews. It's safe to say that the vast majority of us were not overly impressed with these CPUs. And going back to the gaming performance, we can see why. If you bought a Skylake X for gaming, then you really got it wrong because this was not a gaming CPU. And it should have been clear at the start that when Coffee Lake released, it would be a much better consumer-focused CPU. And this is exactly what it's starting to look like. The new cache hierarchy and the mesh topology of Skylake X is the reason why it lags behind in gaming, whereas Coffee Lake is simply Skylake with two extra cores, and that is how it performs, like Skylake with two extra cores. The i7-8700K is everything the i7-7800X should have been. But sadly, it comes with its own issues, and there's a feeling here that Intel is simply rushing this one out, because that is exactly what they're doing. And over at Tom's Hardware, we found out that Coffee Lake would not run on Z270 motherboards. This was clear to me from the start, and even though Coffee Lake uses the same identical LGA-1551 socket, it was obvious to me at least, that Z270 would not have the required power delivery. And here we can see the new Intel Z370 chipset motherboard will have improved power delivery for 6 core processors. This one should have been really obvious from the start. We saw the problem Skylake X has with power draw. Intel has a real issue with adding more cores while maintaining clock speeds. Or more accurately, adding more cores while maintaining the same clock speeds at a reasonable power budget. Skylake X's power draw is through the roof because there's an awful lot of cores there at very high clock speeds. And as you've just saw, Coffee Lake is adding two more cores over the 7700K at around the same clock speeds, yet still on the same 14 nanometer process. Now Intel's claiming it's an improved 14 nanometer process, and it will be, but there's only so 
so much you can improve it. KB Lake was also an improved 14 nanometer process and Skylake X is on that same improved 14 nanometer process compared to Skylake. But you can only improve the same process so much and Coffee Lake CPUs will be power hungry, at least the six core versions. So that's why it requires yet another new motherboard. Eight months after Z270 was launched and now we've got Z370. When the reviews go live, this needs to be talked about because Intel is taking the piss with this. But that isn't all because there's a staggered 300 series rollout. There won't be any H370 or B350 motherboards available until next year. And we can actually see in this slide, October the 5th, we're getting the K-SKUs and premium consumer processors, but it's not until the first half of 2018 where we see the broad consumer processors. And looking at this, the first half of 2018, that means the second quarter of 2018, because if these were launching in the first quarter, it would say first quarter, not the first half. Maybe some will roll out earlier and some a bit later on, but we're looking at a potential gap of nine months between the premium consumer processors and the broad consumer processors. That's an awful big gap. Problem with this is, of course, the Z370 motherboards are more expensive. They are the premium motherboards. But what if you're buying one of those locked processors? You're still going to have to pay the extra for Z370 motherboards that support overclocking, even though your CPU doesn't. As a reminder, at launch, half of them are locked and half are unlocked. So maybe you're thinking, well, that's not a huge problem. Why not just buy the unlocked versions, the K versions? Well, over at sweetlockers.com, there is one reason for why that may be an issue. We're in yet another very poorly translated article. The gist of the story here is that Coffee Lake is a paper launch, which by now should be pretty obvious. Coffee Lake should have been launching in January, but Intel has brought it forward in very, very small numbers. And we can see here that the launch was originally scheduled to take place in early 2018, but it's been moved in a quarter because of Ryzen. It's all well and good pulling in a launch, but you still need to have the actual products to sell. And simply put, they don't have them. There's going to be a big shortage here. And it appears that the availability of Intel's Coffee Lake is going to be very low on launch day and when they contacted some Nordic distributors they were basically told that they're only going to get a handful of CPUs but worse still none of the Nordic distributors got any K-series SKUs no unlocked CPUs that is no 8700Ks no 8600Ks and no 8350Ks they have only got locked SKUs that is the 8700, the 8400, and the 8100s. Now, this is Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Finland, and that's some pretty wealthy countries there. Although Intel does treat the Nordics like a backwater, or at least when it comes to press relations. But for there to be no K-series unlocked SKUs at launch, yet there will only be Z370 motherboards, this is a little bit beyond a joke. The situation is not expected to improve until the middle of December, but no one dares to provide any guarantees of good access until the turn of the year. And one of the more interesting comments was, it feels like Intel is shooting itself in the foot with the launch of Coffee Lake. As Coffee Lake is simply going to kill the sales of KB Lake, I mean, take your pick between a 6-core CPU and a 4-core CPU. Obviously, the 8700K looks an awful lot better. And even this 6-core 6 6-thread i5 at $257, going to be faster than the 7700K, but it costs quite a bit less. So it looks like Intel is basically Osborning KB Lake nine months or so after the CPU released. And it's going to be a couple months before you can get hold of them. Why on earth would they do this? As simply put, Intel is only releasing Coffee Lake in order to curb the sales of Ryzen. Last month in a video I showed how AMD was gaining a lot of sales with Ryzen in one large German store, Mind Factory. We can see that in March they were down at 27.7% and in August they had more than doubled that to 56.1% with Intel down at 43.9%. In September it rose again just by 1% but AMD is maintaining their market share lead in this one very large store and this will be repeated elsewhere. So effectively what Intel has done here is the mother and father of all paper launches. They have basically taken the decision to kill off KB Lake three months early by releasing Coffee Lake even though they don't have the CPUs available to sell and the reason for it is simple. Yes they are Osborning their own CPUs. KB Lake looks dead now but these CPUs are just enticing enough I believe that they can also slow down AMD's Ryzen sales. What kind of effect this will have overall, I'm simply not sure. But you can certainly imagine that the type of people who will get hold of these CPUs will be enthusiasts. 
the type of people who are on message boards and forums. So Intel is basically going for these guys and trying to grab the mind share back. Nobody else will get hold of one of these. Certainly not if you're in the Nordics, you won't. But this paper launch is just a, a mind share grab, basically. They have lost so much mind share due to Ryzen and they are prepared to take a monetary loss in order to get that back. There's a couple more things to talk about here because the motherboard guys were already sitting on a bunch of unsold Z270 motherboards. And this chart shows why. These motherboard guys are building a lot of these Z270 motherboards. But when Ryzen comes onto the scene, the sales of these premium consumer motherboards have gone through the floor. There's a bunch of guys like MSI, Asus, Gigabyte sitting on a bunch of unsold Z270s and now with even less chance of shifting them because Coffee Lake is now Z370. We have a saying in Scotland which goes, hell mend them. And this is how I feel about the motherboard guys. As you remember, some of them were pretty slow to buy into Ryzen and decided to go with Z270 instead. That decision has come back and bit them on the ass big time and it's everything they deserve. Hail mend them. And we'll soon see how they feel about trying to shift Z370 motherboards with a bunch of locked CPUs. Good luck with that one guys, you're gonna need it. Another big reason for why Intel has done this right now is that the third quarter financials are coming up and it should be pretty obvious that Ryzen is making a bit of a dent into Intel's client consumer group. Intel's still gonna make a massive amount of money because they always do, but when their client computing group numbers are scrutinized, I think there's a fair chance of seeing a bit of a drop here compared to the third quarter of last year, I mean. Sales in this segment do appear to be down and the prices are down as well. 7700Ks are below $300 now on Amazon. Sadly for Intel, there's an R7 1700 even cheaper and the competition is very fierce. This has got to be having some kind of effect on Intel's bottom line and by releasing Coffee Lake now, they can basically say to their shareholders, yeah, we've had a tough three or four months. AMD is back, competitive with Ryzen, but look, here is our new Coffee Lake and we're back in the lead again. Even though they don't really have anything to sell, this kind of stuff is just par for the course. So yeah, that's how I analyze that. Intel is taking a hit. They're basically sacrificing KB Lake because they know that any damage they do to themselves is going to hurt AMD as well. This is one of the biggest problems AMD has. With Intel having so much money, they can pull stuff like this. Whereas right now, AMD is making pretty decent money on Ryzen. And I was actually talking to a PR guy at AMD recently and I said, AMD needs to head off Coffee Lake before it launches with some price cuts. At 1700X at $300, compared to the 8700K at 389, that is a no brainer still. Yeah, the 8700K is a good gaming CPU. So is the 7700K. People are still buying Ryzen over that and the 1700X at 300 bucks, to me that's still a no brainer choice over the 8700K. The thing here is though, AMD is still obviously selling these CPUs. We can see the 1700X is one of the better sellers, selling even more than the 1700. So even though from AMD's point of view, this would be a good clear mind share one. You can imagine the reviews, 8700K, $389, 1700X, $300. Every reviewer is going to look at that and say, yeah, it's still not very good value, is it, Intel? The problem here is AMD really, really needs the money they're making from these 1700Xs. And they also know that this is just a pure paper launch by Intel. So dropping prices is going to be harmful to them, even though Intel is going to get some pretty decent reviews, I feel, for the 8700K. So hopefully you're finding all this interesting the strategy here and Intel are completely right to do this. This is all about grabbing Mindshare again and the press will basically fall for it en masse. They are right now lining up to tell us how great the 8700K is for sure. But looking at all this together, the paper launch and how they're killing off KB Lake, the damage that they are doing to their motherboard guys, now hopefully you find this pretty interesting because it's very much shades of grey. Nothing is ever black and white. Right, I'm going to bring this one to an end. I had meant to talk about other stuff, but clearly I have talked an awful lot about Forza 7 and right there, even more about Intel. I'm not entirely sure what to do with these type of videos. Obviously, I could have been talking about Intel last week and I could have talked about Forza a couple of days ago, but instead of launching a bunch of smaller videos, you know that I generally prefer to do one larger video. This does cost me financially though, and there's no great reason for why I'm doing it. I've been thinking about doing doing more of this type of thing, just like a tech update type thing, maybe once per week, maybe on a Friday. I'm not entirely sure what I would call that. So let me know what you think about that. For what I could call this sort of series, would I launch a video once a week, maybe on the Friday, just talking about and analyzing the week's tech news, just to get something a bit more regular into the channel. Because like I said, the hardware stuff is going to be drying up over this next three months. And a lot of the analysis is based around that. 
And finally, I have a new Amazon store. This is quite interesting. Amazon has just recently allowed certain YouTubers to set up their own shop front, basically their own Amazon store. Held on Amazon, you can see here at the top my URL. It's pretty much what it was like before. It's just simply a link to Amazon.com. Only the American Amazon so far, USA. I'm guessing the British, French, German, etc. will come a little bit later. But until that point, you can still just use my old Amazon links. But for you guys in America, I've gone through a bunch of parts and I've chosen those that I think are pretty good deals. You can see I've got my own fractal design case here. It's a great case. I absolutely love it. And there's a Threadripper 1950X. It all kind of makes some sort of sense. You've got your X39 Aorus motherboard, which was my favourite. And there's some memory there. Memory prices are absolutely dreadful right now. Power supplies. I've got a whole line full of graphics cards and you can see what my choices are there. I'm not exactly blown away by the graphics market obviously and it should be obvious why. A bunch of Ryzen CPUs and a bunch of other stuff. I'll keep adding more to it but for sure if you're shopping on Amazon, even if you're not interested in any of these parts, simply by shopping on Amazon through my links, I will get a commission of maybe 3 to 5% on each sale. It's not worth an awful lot to me but every little certainly helps. If there's something that you think should be on it or if there's something you disagree with feel free to let me know in the comments or or just drop me an email at the channel email similarly if you see any really good deals let me know and I'll stick it on for the duration of the deal. Whenever I add something new, it should go to the very first column. So that'll be handy if you see something that is a really good deal for a day. And you can always check back and see if I've stuck something on there. I've got a new UK link as well. So check that one out. My old one died on me as I did something that I shouldn't have done. So I haven't been using my old UK Amazon link for a while. I've got a new one now though. And hopefully I'll have a new UK store as well at some point before too long. But that's it for now. As always, thanks for watching. And you'll find all these links in the description below. Oh yeah, also, next to my Patreon link, I've added a new check out my Amazon store link. Again, this is just for the USA Amazon. At some point, I'll get this all figured out and make a link that works for everyone. But until that point, have a good time reading the Coffee Lake reviews and I'll catch you later, guys.